Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Katie Tynan. She's the founder and chief talent strategist at Lightskip Consulting Group. Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. And it's interesting because... Um, I was I was actually reading through your book, um, you know, well, over the last kind of few weeks. And it was interesting because you had some stuff in there that I kind of went through um, a couple of years ago. But maybe before we kind of get into all that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, that sounds great. So I grew up outside of Boston. Okay. Um, in Lexington, Massachusetts, which is best known as the loser town of the American Revolution, <laughs> because <laughs> that is where we all stood up in front of the British on the green and tried to play it their way, and it didn't work out very well. So I always tell people that that's why I ended up being an entrepreneur and a nonconformist as a career, is because... I spent every single year at six o'clock in the morning in April down on the green watching the reenactment of the first battle of the American Revolution in which we lost. Interesting. So what I learned is when you follow the rules and you do what you're supposed to do, it doesn't work out very well. So that... (laughs) No, I I think that's really good advice, actually. I've kind of lived my whole career that kind of same way. Yeah, and I and I think it's good advice, uh, not necessarily in every possible circumstance, but certainly um, I would not, especially in this day and age, think that following the rules was necessarily an automatic path to success. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. And I, I think the thing that at least has worked for me, it's, it's easier to be kind of a rebel inside of, um, you know, like a big company or organization than it is to try to get everything to change to how you want it to be right like which is kind of an interesting dilemma I guess but do you do you kind of agree with that statement yeah so I would say I'm a really big um, proponent of the idea of knowing your sphere of influence and understanding your span of control right so I can be a rebel and control certain things within the context of my career. And then there are certain things that are way outside of what I can control. And so I try really hard to stay in that lane of where I feel like I have influence and control and ability to create things my way. And then I also understand that in the larger picture, there are things that I'm just not going to be able to control or change. And so it's not worth my time and energy to try and beat my head against the wall on those things. No, I 100% agree. So walk me through kind of, you've done tons of kind of education and you've been to kind of a bunch of different schools. Can you walk us through kind of that journey and, and kind of why did you decide to take what you took in university? Yeah, so I started out my career, um, I went to UMass Amherst, and when I went to UMass Amherst, my intent was to be an elementary school teacher. That was my goal. And when I went for orientation, they had run out of advisors for the elementary ed program. And so I had a biology professor as my advisor. Oh, wow. And (laughs) he looked at my background, and he listened to me for a couple of minutes, and he said, Katie, I don't think you should get a degree in elementary ed. I said, really, why? He said, because it's too narrow. You're You're a creative person, and you're a curious person, and I know you've picked this as a career, but he said, I think it's too narrow a focus for you go get a psychology degree or something like that because it will let you explore different things. And to be honest, that's the best advice I could possibly have gotten at that moment in my career is don't pigeonhole yourself too early. Don't put yourself in a position where you have a credential that only allows you to do one thing. Sure. And so I 
took his advice and I went and got a psychology degree and I discovered really sort of late in my psychology degree that there's not a lot of practical applications <laughs> sure. for that, right? Like what job does that prepare you for? Really nothing. But what it had prepared me to do was think critically and to take a curiosity approach to work. So what I did from there was I went out and I got a job right after school, right? And I had sure. an admin job as an editorial assistant in a publishing company. But at the time, I was the person who, when somebody couldn't print, wiggled the plugs and checked to see if everything was plugged in. So I literally went from a psychology degree to an administrative job to being in IT in a two-year time span wow. simply because I followed a curiosity down a path that I never would have expected to go. And that launched me into a 10-year IT career. <laughs> okay. So how did you, like, what made you decide to try going, like, IT? Like, was it just kind of a, was it always been kind of a passion or, or how did you fall into it? No, I had no interest whatsoever in it, except okay. <laughs> that I was working at this company, which was a publishing company. And at the time, and I'm going to date myself here, it was at the time before the internet had really established itself. And so connectivity was really between different parts of the company. You had, we were a, a um, subset of Harcourt Brace, which was based out in San Diego. Okay. And so they sent out a couple of IT people who installed a server. They connected us up to the home office and said, there, now we're going to do everything online. And they went away and everything broke, everything crashed. And my boss was frustrated and said, this is annoying. Katie, you're the one that wiggles the plugs on the printer. Do you think <laughs> you can fix this? And I said, I don't know. But because, again, I'm a curious person and because I like solving problems, sure. it was interesting to me. So I took that opportunity to say, hey, let me try this and see what I think, as opposed to saying, gosh, I've never had any interest in IT. Why would I do that? So I think by experimenting and and finding out with an open mind, I learned that I had a talent that I didn't know I had. So that's how I got into IT. It was utterly by chance, not by intent. That's that's wild. That's cool, though. But, I, well, I, I still think that's a lot of the case how a lot of people get into IT even nowadays, right? Like, you just kind of stumble upon it or you you try something, you get good at it or you get passionate about it. And then you kind of make it into a career, right? So that's that's actually quite fascinating. So fast forward a little bit. Walk me through kind of, you, you do this 10-year stint in IT. How did you kind of go back into kind of doing what you're currently doing? Like walk me through that transition. Yeah, so there I was in IT and I'm fixing computers and I'm solving network problems and I still love people because I've always loved people. That was okay. why I went into psychology in the first place. So at the time, I was one of those pretty rare IT people that liked the technology and liked the people. Okay. Most people at the time who were in IT were those people in the dark closet that you don't talk to and they speak a language you don't understand and you only talk to them if something's really broken. Sure, fair <laughs> and, enough. And then the, the industry has really evolved since then. But at the time, that was very much how it was. And I was an anomaly because I liked the business part of it as much as I liked the technology part of it. So what I started to realize is, wow, people come to me and say, Katie, our technology's broken. And when I start to work with them on that, I discover that it's not the technology at all. It's communication, it's process, it's organization, it's interpersonal problems. But it's so much easier to say our CRM sucks yeah, than it is to yeah. say our Salesforce has a communication and collaboration problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, you're, you're not wrong. Yeah, that's interesting. And so that led me back all the way full circle, which is now I understand the technology and I understand the people operational part of the issue. And so I'm positioned to help organizations solve that problem in a more holistic way. I can say, okay, I understand how your CRM works. 
and I understand how the technology works, but I also see how these relationships and communication layers and process and motivation and leadership problems are impacting your technology problem. And so then I was proposing solutions that really included both sides of that coin. And that's how I got all the way back around to organizational development as what I would consider what I do currently, which is helping people and organizations work better together, understanding that we live in and work in an economy that is really technology driven. Sure. No, I, I 100% agree. Like, I, it's it's actually quite quite fascinating how, you know, technology is just kind of almost taken over every industry or or kind of is about to right and and that doesn't necessarily mean like all doom and gloom and, and kind of a scary thing like I think you need to kind of embrace it and it makes our our jobs and our lives a lot easier in a lot of cases not all the time but but walk me through kind of what you kind of do and and what's kind of your ideal client so for me there's a couple of specific things that I do nowadays, especially, which is I've really honed in on this new manager experience. And okay. the reason I've honed in on the new manager experience is because when we look at big numbers like engagement and we see that only 30 percent of our workforce is engaged and that's a very depressing number. Sure. We look at that and say, gosh. That means that 70% of the people who are working today aren't really happy <laughs> at yeah. work. They're not engaged. They're not excited about it. And again, in the same way that I've done in every other part of my career, I looked at that from a problem-solving perspective and said, who is the person or what's the role in the organization that has the most influence in how we feel about work? And the answer to that is it's typically – our direct manager. Okay. It's typically the person that is working directly with us and funneling what work we're going to do or not going to do. And I say this in the context of how corporations work. I also work, and you know this, outside of that as a freelancer. Yeah. And so things are different in that context. But within the context of a corporation, the person who has the most influence in how you feel about work is usually your boss. Right. And the problem is Many, many companies, you would be stunned to know how many, don't offer any training whatsoever to new managers. Interesting. And that's a problem because the management role is so different from the individual contributor role. The way you are successful as a manager is so fundamentally different than how you are successful as a leader. And so to me, we don't invest in those people we don't give them the support and tools they need to be great at what they do. We throw them in the deep end of the pool and that results in typically a 12 month period where that new manager is bad at their job. Right? Sure. And when they're bad at their job, all the other people on their team are frustrated. They're impacted by that. They're unhappy. They're disengaged and they don't like what's happening. So we allow that to happen. And that creates this disengagement in a lot of ways across systemically across the organization that's then hard to recover from. So for me, the work that I feel has the best opportunity to make people feel better about their jobs, be happier at work, do better work, is to focus on making those new managers better at what they do faster. Sure. And, and that's why you wrote the book, correct? Correct. Yep, absolutely. So that is why the new book, which is How Did I Not See This Coming? The New Manager's Guide to Avoiding Total Disaster, <laughs> <laughs> exists is because so many new managers are having that disastrous experience of trying to do a really good job, trying to do the right thing, but not having the tools, not having the skills, not having the support, and therefore being bad at what they do and creating this ripple effect of making everybody around them really unhappy. Sure. Uh, the other thing that I think, and I, I kind of want your thoughts on is like, at least coming from, from the tech perspective, and I'm sure it's, it might be similar um, to other industries. It might not. I, I really don't know, but I find like 
like take myself for an example. Like I'm kind of trained as like a you know web web designer. Like I went to school to basically be a web designer, and now I'm um, you know chief design officer at a, a startup. But the the thing that's funny about kind of as you progress in your career, and the running joke that I've kind of heard is you you get promoted into kind of this management role. And you were never trained in being a manager. And in a lot of cases, you might not ever wanted to be a manager, but like you're the one of the only people on the team that has enough experience to actually manage the rest of the team. And so like you get promoted to so far out of your comfort zone that you end up kind of being terrible because you don't even know what to do. And I think that kind of ties into what you're talking about or what we were just talking about is where you're you're kind of this new manager and if you don't get trained or you have no idea what's happening you end up just being terrible and like you know you might lose a friend which you you kind of talk about in the book which I actually kind of found interesting but but is that kind of a fair statement or or how does somebody kind of get to be this kind of new manager and they they're kind of struggling with it cuz they weren't trained in that yeah it is very acute in the IT industry, more so I would say than in any other industry. And of course, because I spent so much time there, sure. I have a really strong feeling of connection to what's happening in the IT industry. In fact, I chair the leadership track for Interop, which is um, one of the biggest IT conferences. Sure. It happens in May in Las Vegas. And we put together the leadership track because it is an acute issue in the technology industry, and here's why. Technology, unlike a lot of other industries, has this sort of bizarre situation <laughs> where people have to become managers in order to get more money, Yeah, but they really, really don't want to be because they love the technology itself. They totally. love the work. So take somebody who's an amazing coder and who really loves getting immersed in creating things and coding and developing new software and solving business problems and take that person and take away everything they love and tell them <laughs> that now their job is to help other people who are not as good coders as they are do their jobs. And now that person is unhappy because they're not doing what they love to do. They're having to do something they don't love to do. And so they get frustrated. So what happens in IT is we force people down that track in a way that they don't want. And we don't create an alternative track that says, oh, you just want to be a really deeply technical, specialized person. Great. Go down this road and do that. So what I think is happening in particularly in IT now is organizations are starting to understand that just because you're a great technical person doesn't then say you're the best candidate to be a manager. And instead, what they're doing is saying, who is self-selecting and saying, I want to be a leader, a manager, a person who organizes and coordinates and helps other people get better at what they do? How do we find those people and put them on the management track while also providing career development opportunities for the people who just want to stay really deeply technical people. Sure. No, I, I think that's that's actually quite interesting. But you, you talk about these kind of five truths in the book. Do you maybe want to kind of cover what you like exactly kind of cover in the book so, so people can fully understand kind of what you talk about in the book? Well, no, because I want them to buy it. And sure. Eat it. <laughs> yeah, fair. Oh, that's fair. But, but I will certainly talk about the ideas in it and, and where it came from. So first of all, when I had the idea to write this book, um, it was because I have a very collaborative relationship with the Association for Talent Development. And ATD is an organization that helps um, create content for training and development, learning and development specialists. They're an industry association of learning and development specialists, and they're the ones that published the book. Okay. And so I was in conversation with them because I was writing blog posts and recording videos and creating content for them. And they said, we really think you should write a book. And okay. I said, 
I already did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wrote a book in 2010 about this. I wrote a different book in 2015. I'm really sort of tired of writing books. It's a lot of work. Sure. Um, and they said, yeah, but we think it would be really valuable. I said, okay. So we started to noodle around on what would be useful and helpful because we knew we wanted to talk about new managers, but we also know that there's literally hundreds of books written for new managers and right. written about management. I mean, so many already. So we didn't want to put something out there unless, A, it was something that we felt was said something meaningful, but B, that was said in a way that people could relate to and connect to. So as you know from reading the book, it's a little bit of a story. Yeah, and yeah. the reason it's a little bit of a story is because we were trying to think about how to approach this and I was really rolling it around in my head and I said, I have an idea and it might be crazy. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a couple of chapters and I'll send it to you guys and you can tell me what you think. So I wrote the first three chapters and the book is the story of a woman named Julie who has been promoted into a management role. It's a story that resonates with a lot of people because it's happened to a lot of us. Sure. And six months in, her, her top performer, the best person on her team, announces that she's quitting because she doesn't want to work for Julie. Sure. And it's, it's tough. Like, that's a tough thing to hear. Yeah. So I wrote these first three chapters, and I sent them to my editor at ATD. And he was away at the time. He was in Patagonia. <laughs> okay, interesting. And he, he was sort of off the grid at the time on a vacation. And... So he said to me, I'll take them with me on the plane and I'll let you know when I get back what I think. And so I got this text from him, literally from the airport, the first minute that he had service, he texted me and said, I need to know what happens to Julie. And I was like, aha. Interesting. <laughs> now we've got it because the story is that it's her journey and it's not an easy one. And certainly in the beginning, in the very first chapter, She's out there on a limb where she thinks she's about to get fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she goes through and starts learning things that she didn't know about how management works. Most of us are like that. We think management is about telling other people what to do. We think it's about time management. We think it's about putting together project plans and saying, okay, you do this and I'll do this and we'll be done. And it's not. And that's the hardest thing for new managers to really get their heads around is the mindset of management is so different. So these five truths that Julie learns about creating a vision, about developing a team, about understanding team strengths, about setting goals, about learning, about developing trust, those truths that she learns are really the fundamental difference between what people think management is about and what it's really about. No, I, I yeah, I, I think it, it was an interesting read for me. Like, I, I think the thing that, that I really kind of took from it and is like when you – I really like books when they, they basically – like, I, I get it's kind of like fictional, but it's truthful, right? Like, you're not like pointing out two specific people that this happened to, right? But people can relate to that, right? And I think – it's easier to make changes when you're like, oh, yeah, I c that was totally me or, you know, or like that was like somebody I worked for. Right. Like when it's th when it's that personal, I, I think people are, are a lot more kind of engaged and, and they're willing to kind of try some of the stuff that they're reading about. I do. And I think that when it comes from a realization about yourself you're willing to change. Yeah. When it's someone else telling you what you're doing wrong, you sort of automatically become defensive and resist that. Sure. So the reason storytelling is powerful is because I'm telling Julie's story and you're nodding along and going, huh, parts of that are my story too. Yeah, yeah. What does she do? Maybe I could try that. That's a better way to get people to think about what they're doing than for me to say, Gosh, you suck at this. <laughs> sure. No, you're, yeah, totally. So that's why I approach it. The other reason I write books about management is because I think a lot of what's written about management is written either by PhD researchers yeah, yeah. or by <laughs> CEOs who are so far away from that 
experience of that first management job that their writing is just not relatable because they don't remember that visceral feeling of going, oh my God, this was my dream. I, I called my mother when I got promoted to my first management job and said, I made it. <laughs> right, right. It was my dream and now it's awful and I'm bad at it and I don't wanna be. And so I think it's very important when you're trying to work with people who are in that space that you continue to have that empathy and that feeling of appreciation for what they're going through and that you don't trivialize it. I think a lot of people who are doing leadership development do it from this sort of on high theoretical space. And that just isn't all that helpful to someone who's down in the trenches. No, I 100% agree. And I think the other thing too is just like what basically, I, I hate the kind of like, where like, well, I'm a millennial, right? And I don't really care about being put in the little kind of like box of an age range. But I, but I, what I do care about is I think like, obviously people at different ages and different points in their career need and kind of respect almost like different styles, right? And they have different styles and sometimes they're more open to change than others, right? And I think that's partly one of the big challenges where you might need to manage somebody a little bit different that's older compared to younger or, or, or whatever, right? Is that kind of fair to say? It is. So there was a whole um, industry that appeared almost overnight in, I would say, the last decade about consultants trying to explain how to manage millennials. Totally. And it, and it, it I mean, God bless them if they made money off of it, right? Because I always love it when an entrepreneur succeeds in finding a niche. But with that said, mm -hmm. I hated the idea and I still really reject the idea that that there's some problem that millennials have created by existing. That feels yeah, so wrong to me. And so whenever somebody says to me, uh, you know, I want training on how to manage millennials, I always say to them, you do know that they're people, right? <laughs> and, and, and you should manage them like people, meaning everybody is a demographic of one. Sure. Every single person has a unique backstory, has a unique set of motivations and things they're excited about and things that frustrate them. And to your point, communication styles. And I think as a manager, your best tactic is to get to know people as exactly who they are and what their strengths are, and what their hopes and dreams are. And then you can say, that's great, here's what we can do together. So I understand the whole idea that demographically, certain people share certain life experiences and, and all of those things. But with that said, I always say my best advice is forget about everything that you think you know about someone and go get to know them no, <laughs> as fair. an individual. And then at that point, you will have a much better idea of how they're motivated and why they're why they took this job in the first place and how you can best work with them. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that that's actually really interesting. I, I think the thing that I love about being kind of pigeonholed as a millennial is like there is no bar. Like you're basically just pigeonholed into being kind of like lazy and a slacker and never wanted to work. So if you like, I almost sometimes try to use that and tell people to use that as like almost like a strength, because if you actually like show up and deliver and kind of work hard, I think a lot of times people are like, like, like almost sh more shocked, right. Than anything because like you're, you're labeled like you're, you're almost like useless, right? In, in some cases. So I find it kind of funny and I think it's great when somebody's like, oh yeah, you're a millennial. You must like do this. And you're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Right. Like it's, it's always <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is, so I'm generation X and we were told the exact same thing, right? We're slackers. We don't work hard. We don't have a work ethic. Sure, <laughs> All of those sure. things. So I think it comes around with every new generation, this idea of 
the established people who are in the organization who have quote unquote paid their dues and now here comes a younger person and that person is figuring out how things work. They're figuring out and they don't yet know where they fit and what they're good at. They're experimenting and learning. And in a lot of cases, those those things just by themselves are huge assets. I would love if everybody on my team was in that sort of learning mindset. Sure. The I don't know. Let's try. Let's. <laughs> it's sure. sort of the improv thing, right? How do you say yes and? How do you say I don't know, but let's figure it out in a positive way? So to me, I find all of that to be an asset, and I just. I really love it when people come to the table, whatever their age is, whatever their experience is, whatever their background is, and come with an open mind and not come with this closed, narrow idea of what they can do and or what other people can do. No, I I 100% agree. I I think it's actually really interesting. I I think the other thing too is like, I I know like the diversity topic is is really kind of hot right now, but I think like the best stuff and kind of brainstorming and getting people's opinions, at least in my career, have always kind of come from somebody that's totally different than me. Or like, and I think the best example that I I can give that, that I think everybody kind of understands is like, you take the colors like red, white, and blue. In North America, everybody's like, that's the American flag, right? Or America. But if you go to like parts of Europe, they're like, well, that's the colors of like, France and like the French flag, right? And like, so like different parts of the world see something as simple as like three colors. The association is totally different, right? Not all the time, but a lot of the time. But like sometimes I think you don't think about that unless you have people with kind of different backgrounds and and kind of experience to be like, hey, you know what? Like that means this to me. And you're like, oh, okay, right? And like sometimes you can avoid you know, maybe offending somebody or, or maybe you can use it to an advantage, right? In, in some cases. Yeah, I'm definitely a big proponent of the idea that diversity is the source of innovation and that you cannot, with a homogenous group of people, expect to come up with new ideas. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. The best example of what you're talking about, um, I saw at a conference a couple of years ago, a woman put up a picture on the screen and it was a picture of an older city and there were a bunch of people in a boat and the boat was on a canal going through this sort of older city. Okay. And she said, when you look at this, what does it make you think of? And we all being sort of Northern North American European descent people said, oh, it looks like Amsterdam. It looks like people on vacation. Maybe they're having a cruise, something like that. And she said, that's great. Do you know that when I show this in, um, in other parts of the world, primarily what the answer is, is it's a flood and those are <laughs> refugees. Oh. And it's a very negative, like, oh, gosh, those poor people, they're in that boat because there's a flood and their homes have been destroyed. And it was exactly what you just said, just such an eye opening Two people look at the same thing and see completely different things. And that's so important in a global economy to understand whether you're an individual entrepreneur, whether you're working with people from different parts of the world, whether you're a corporation and a brand and out there on social media opening your mouth about things. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> and, and so I think it's just and, – and you know one person – can know all those things. It's just not possible to know everything you need to know. And that's where the power of having a diverse team comes in because you can ask. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. No, I, I think that's actually really interesting. Yeah, I never really. Yeah, you're right. Like in, in certain. Yeah, that's quite the like from holiday to like, you know, being a refugee is quite, quite the spread on, on one photo. That's that's fascinating, actually. But, yeah. So. You, you talk a lot about kind of the future of work and I know you have some kind of online learning and a book and do, do some workshops, but like, what does that kind of mean to you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I will say for me, this is sort of the, 
the fundamental curiosity. I've said all through this conversation, I'm a curious person. Yeah. The, the thing that underpins all my curiosity is that I find work itself interesting and weird, <laughs> right? Okay, like, interesting, yeah. It's here we are, and we're so far removed from what our ancestors so many years ago did to survive. So work used to be hunting and gathering and creating shelter and not getting eaten by tigers. Like sure. that was work, but it was also life. And how do you relate something like a social media specialist as a job or you know, a coder, even a software developer as a job, how do you relate that all the way back to that fundamental, we're working in order to create what we need to survive and to live as, as humans and to do some of these things. So a lot of what we think of as work feels sort of artificial. It feels totally. weird. And I think a lot of the stress that comes along with some of the aspects of work are because there's that artificiality and that distance from that sort of visceral sense of why do I do this? <laughs> yeah, no fair. You know, when you're sitting in a meeting on a Tuesday afternoon talking about the different colors of a potential logo redesign and you're like scratching your head going, what does this have to do with my life? Like, tell me again sure. why yeah. this matters. Um so that's an interest of mine. I also find that some of the things that we do because we've always done them and we have these habits that ultimately are not helping us. So you think about commuting and you and I are very technology oriented people. So I always say there is nothing that I can't do from my home office as relates to doing my job. Like literally, I cannot think of a single thing that I need to be physically in the same office with people to do. Totally. And yet we still have every morning a two hour period of time where people spend hours in their cars stuck in traffic trying to physically become present at a workplace. Yeah. And it drives me bananas. No. So. <laughs> Interesting. OK, I 100 percent agree with you, but could keep going. Sorry. No, that's fine. So for me, the idea of the future of work and the idea of what we will do someday in the future is all about how are we putting these pieces together? How are we changing our habits and changing our behaviors to make things better? A lot of what we hear about in the news about, you know, the robot economy and how artificial intelligence is going to take all of our jobs and we're all going to be homeless and nobody's going to be <laughs> making any money except for 1% of the people like Elon Musk who are going to be sitting in mansions. And that's a sort of a negative idea of what the future looks like. And to me, I feel like if we invest our time and our effort and our energy creatively, we can figure out how to make work awesome not horrible. We totally. can figure out how to connect people and technology in new ways to make things better. And so what I want is for us to figure those things out and not to be reactive and say, let's wait until it's terrible sure. <laughs> and then come up with a solution. I'd rather imagine what the future of work could look like and then try and work towards that as a positive outcome. So that's how I think about it. And, and a lot of what I like to read about and understand is where are we now? What are the trends? What's happening? You know, we've heard a lot about the World Economic Forum and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and some of the trends related to um, the virtual economy sure. and a lot of other things that are happening. But what do we do with that information? What does that help us do? So that's what I'm very curious about. Yeah, no, that's that's actually quite fascinating. The, the thing is, and like, I could be wrong, but wasn't like basically the nine to five uh, workday like related to basically like it took that long for like a machine to basically like do its job, right? So like back like, you know, 100 years ago or whatever, right? Like, and, and like the thing that I never understood about kind of working nine to five is like, I'm not a morning person. Like, some days, like, I don't feel like I'm awake till, like, noon. So, 
I'm most productive from like I can be tired like all day, and like eight nine nine p.m. rolls around, I'm wide awake. Like it would make way more sense for me to like either work late into kind of like start in the evening, maybe work into the early hours, or or start in the afternoon. And if you like kind of meet your deadlines and you show up to the meetings that you need to be at, even if they are in the morning, you know, a few times a week, but like, do you really care where I'm physically located or what time I'm actually, you know, doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Like, does it really matter if it's 9 a.m. or 9 p.m.? Like, as long as everything's getting done? And I think like, it sounds so simple, but it's like, we don't really we try to make everybody just do this like nine to five or, or like whatever their hours are. But like, it, it just seems so broken to me. Yeah, you're not wrong. And um, there's a couple of things that you just touched on as you go through this. So first of all, yes, the three shift model was designed around machines and maximizing the efficiency of assembly lines yeah. because machines could work 24 hours a day, but people couldn't. Sure. And so in order to get the best out of that, they created three eight hour shifts and rotated people in and out. Right. So that's a legacy from a very old economic structure. Second of all, we know from sleep research that was conducted back in the sixties and seventies that our bodies have rhythms throughout the day and the night. So at night, we go in and out of deep sleep and we come up to that REM cycle where we're dreaming and then we dip back down into deep sleep. But what a lot of people don't know is your body has similar rhythms during the day. Okay. So when you wake up in the morning, you typically have a period of time in the morning, it's about 60 to 90 minutes of deep focused attention. Okay. And you have, I'm sure, felt this at some point. Yeah, and it's not sure. necessarily in the morning, but it's when you are working on something and you're head down in it, you're focused, you feel really good about what you're doing, you're chugging along. And then about an hour or so into it, an hour and a half into it, your attention starts to wander. Yep. And you start to come up out of that. So this is all research by a guy named Nathaniel Kleitman. And it's called your ultradian rhythm okay. <laughs> as opposed to a circadian rhythm. And he described these cycles in your, in your attention span. And what he said, and he's not wrong as far as I've observed, is you have these deep attention cycles and then you come up out of them and you need to take a break. Whether that's go for a walk, whether that's eat, whether that's take a nap, whatever that is. And they get shorter and shorter during the course of the day. So you have a longer one in the morning. Then you have shorter and shorter ones. Then for a lot of people, and it sounds like yourself included, you have another long one in sort of the late evening totally. period. Yep. When it's dark, it's quiet, nothing else is going on, and you can fall back into that deep concentration state. But that's not how our work day is designed. Totally. And so there we are with an eight hour day to sit at a desk, which is like the worst of all possible things for productivity. No, totally. I understand. Agree. Yep. Yeah. So it's true. It is not how we as as biologically how we're designed to work. And yet we have that sort of legacy structure imposed on us because that's how corporations, particularly manufacturing corporations, worked when machines were the thing. Sure. So so are we going to change that someday? Sure, probably. <laughs> yeah, fair. It, it'll, but it'll catch on trendy, right? Time. Well, yeah, but I also think, and this is another trend that we've seen, is increasingly people are not working for corporations as employees anymore anyway. Sure. So we have a 30 to 40% gig economy going on right now. We have people like you and I who don't have an employer. Instead, we either work for ourselves or we're entrepreneurs and we are the employer, but it's a tiny business or we're freelancers or we're doing something, um, whether it's Uber or whether it's one of the freelance marketplaces so you have a really strong growth in an economy that doesn't operate on those cycles. And I think that's really where you're going to see those changes is because people feel so much more productive 
when they can decide for themselves when they work, how they work, who they work with, what projects they work on. Sure. But, okay, so, like, I, I get that, like, that's kind of happening, but how do you work or what do you recommend to kind of the, the big corporations that are, are looking to change because they know they need to change? Yeah, it's tough. So a lot of companies, um, and you've seen this in a lot of places, especially in the marketing, and I think the marketing precedes the behavior. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so if you go look at most companies' websites and they talk about, especially if you go to their careers page, and they'll say XYZ Fortune 500 company is a great place to work. We believe in flexible schedules. We believe in work-life balance. We believe, we believe, we believe. But the policies don't support the marketing Interesting. yet. Interesting, okay. And so what's happening is, and we already know this, big organizations struggle to change. They're not good at it. Change is hard. And especially in a big established bureaucratic organization, change is really hard. So that's where we're seeing organizations trying to figure out how do they adapt their policies in a fair way, in a consistent way, in a non-discriminatory way to allow for some of these things that historically haven't happened or worked. And so I think that's where we're seeing companies try to make those changes. But I'll be honest, big companies are struggling with it. Smaller companies are much more nimble. They're much more able to adjust and adapt and personalize work to their employees because they can change those policies without 50 million different reviews and committees and meetings and all of that kind of stuff. So I think it's coming, but I think it's slower than we would all like it to be. Yeah, that's fair. And I, I guess the thing, and I was having this conversation with, with kind of, um, she, she works for the, uh, just like the government in the, the labor division, um, just in the city I live in. And she, she asked me the question, like, like how come somebody or like entrepreneurs aren't necessarily like building something, um, you know, more for like governments. And I said, because there's way too much red tape, it's way easier to build something without like kind of almost like what we talked about at the beginning where you, you don't even really understand why they're doing things the way they're doing. And you're like, this is broken. I'm going to build something to fix that. And then if that catches on with maybe the ground level employees because you're either one of them or you know people doing that and eventually that app or, or whatever kind of spreads throughout that organization, it's easier to do it that way and then they're kind of almost forced to adapt that than trying to go in from the top and, and say, you know, you guys should really use this because of based on my research that, you know, we can save you tons of time here, here and here or, or whatever it is. But like, I always found that kind of interesting, right? It's like, it's way easier to just come in and say, here, we're just going to start doing it, than try to go through kind of like all the red tape to change. Have you kind of found that or, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think change and change management happens in different ways. So the top down idea of change, we're going to shift from doing A to doing B is a struggle. Whereas to your point, the bottom up concept of change, hey, I found a new way to do this. I'm excited about it. I'm going to tell my friends about it. They're going to do it too. And all of a sudden we've changed what we we're doing because people have adopted this new thing. In some ways that's easier, but there's a counterpoint to that. And okay. I'll use, I'll use a government example, no, which perfect. is um, the public schools. So what are teachers doing in public schools? They're finding apps that help them do something in their educational process, right? So yeah. teacher A finds this really awesome app that allows their students to create some kind of cool presentation and share it with one another and share it with their parents and all of these things. And they think it's awesome and the kids think it's awesome and the parents are excited until one of the parents calls the school and says, hey, my child's personal information is publicly accessible on the internet. Mm, interesting, and yeah. that's a problem. Sure. So the problem with bottom-up is that a lot of times, even though people are really enthusiastic about it, the change happens in a way that breaks compliance. Yeah. 
Oh, Whereas the flip side is top down change is a lot harder to get people enthusiastic and excited about. Sure. So I think smart companies and smart organizations are trying to synthesize those two things, right? They're trying to reach out and say, what are the things you guys want to do? You tell us what's not working, what's frustrating, what's hard, and then let us curate the solutions for that and come back with something that is compliant, that meets your needs, that's awesome, and that we can then figure out how to pilot and integrate in a way that works. Sure. So, so that's almost like the top, ideal. Top and bottom and kind of meet in the middle at the same time. Right. But it doesn't always work as beautifully as we'd all like it to. Sure. No, <laughs> no, that's that's really that's interesting. Um but but sadly we're we're running out of time so maybe let's close the show with w- mentioning where people can get more information about yourself the company your book and on all the other things you're involved in yeah so the easiest way to get a hold of me um, my website is katietynan.com i'm on twitter at katietynan i'm on linkedin at katietynan <laughs> sure So everybody should feel free to reach out to me and connect to me. I'm really happy to answer questions. I'm happy to provide resources. Um, So those are really the best sources for people to find me. And then all of my books are available on Amazon. Um, So just go to Amazon and search Katie Tynan and you will find me there as well. Sure. And I really appreciate having the time to hang out with you and talk about all this stuff today. Yeah, me as well. And just so people know, you're, it's K-A-T-Y and then your last name's T-Y-N-A-N. That is yeah. right. Perfect. So, no, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed our chat. I, I wish we had more time because there was some other things that I think I would want your thoughts on. But So maybe we'll do another one of these at some point. But Again, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also, check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future. 